in Luke chapter five, Jesus was busy preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus was busy calling disciples to himself. Jesus was busy teaching in a synagogue. Jesus was busy healing the sick. And he was becoming so famous and successful and popular that it says in verse 15, it says over here, yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He often withdrew, not once, not twice, but he did this often. He did this what? Often. Talk to me, he did this often. So this was Jesus' lifestyle. Retreat, return. Retreat, return. Back and forth. Devotion and action. Jesus was busy, but he knew his limits. He knew when too much was too much. He knew when to stop, when to be recharged and be refreshed, when to retreat, when to return. When was it time for devotion? When was it time for action? So there's nothing wrong about working hard. What you need to know is, have you reached your limits? When to slow down and withdraw to spend time alone to meet with God. This week at our retreat, Prof. Roger reminded us, not once did Jesus rebuke Martha for being busy. In life, we do get busy. We do work hard. Martha's problem was that she was becoming worried. She was becoming anxious about many things, such as she was getting irritable and angry easily. She was distracted by things that are going on. And even when Jesus was sitting right in front of her, she couldn't focus on him. Is this your problem too? That even if Jesus is right in front of you, you are too distracted that you miss him. You know, we can come to church and have the best praise and worship and have the best presence of God and you miss Jesus. This was Martha's problem. She reached her limits and she didn't know how to stop. When we don't have a pace of life like Jesus's, the rhythm of retreat and return, devotion and action, imago day, miss your day. Worry and anxiety will set in. And you become easily upset, angry with God. Martha said, Jesus, don't you care? that I'm overworked and no one's helping me. You become easily angry with people. You become upset with things. So you will lose your inner joy. And you can't find the work-life balance. You can balance work and life and God and church. Some of you here have been burning candles at both ends and you have reached your limits. And the Holy Spirit is telling you, it is time to slow down. Even if just for a little bit, to do what Jesus did, to withdraw to a quiet, lonely place to worship, to pray, to reconnect with your heavenly Father. This is why it's called silence and solitude. Silence to be quiet enough to listen to God. Solitude, to be alone, to engage the presence of God. I want to say the secret ingredient here is not in the quietness. It's not in the solitude per se. The secret ingredient is God himself. It is in his presence you'll find fullness of life. It is in his presence there's joy forevermore and there is liberty and freedom and rest for your soul. 
I wonder how many of you have experienced what Sun and I have learned over the years. <laughs> we work and work and work until we are totally worn out and tired. And we take a vacation to recharge, supposedly to take a rest. But when the vacation is over, we don't feel rested. <laughs> if anything, we feel even more tired. Why? Because we have worked hard, so now we want to play hard. We played so hard, we ate so much, we walked and shopped till we drop. We swam and jack ski until we became sunburnt. And now we need a holiday to overcome that holiday. We need a vacation to rest from that vacation. How many of you know what I'm talking about, yeah? Turn to your neighbors and say, he's talking about you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, how about this, how about this, how about this? This one I'm sure you can identify. You work so hard, Monday to Friday, you work Friday night, you came back and you're so worn out. So now you say, this weekend, we're gonna pamper ourselves by binging on Netflix and Korean dramas, 16 episodes at a go. <laughs> one sitting, you got your popcorn, you got your chicken wing, you got your phone to get grab food, and then you're gonna watch 16 episodes to finish that. <laughs> what? Uh, Alice in Borderland. <laughs> and now, you have a bad migraine on Sunday night. You, oh, you have migraine headache. Your sleeping pattern is totally messed up. You feel as if you've been to Europe, you're having jet lag because you have not slept. Monday morning, you woke up and you're even more tired. Your soul is not rested. It's not refreshed. You go back to the office just as moody, as stressed out, as fed up, if not even more. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking vacations. There's nothing wrong with watching TV or partying hard with friends over the weekend. It's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with all that. You are just not nourishing your soul. Because your soul, my soul, was created by God to be refreshed and revived by His breath, Amen. to be renewed and recharged by His Spirit. God breathed into Adam and He became a living soul. Yes. Remember what Jesus says, Matthew 11, verse 28, the verse 30, practically the last three years, every week, I mentioned this verse. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because only with a rested soul will you find the easy yoke and the light burden. Only then will you discover balance. Only then will you find work-life balance. So many of you, this is the most common question our members are asking me for the last few years. Pastor, how to find work-life balance? How to find family, God, church balance? How am I able to excel in the marketplace and, and to have promotion and, and to take on responsibility at the same time have a happy marriage, be a good parent, and at the same time serve in church, go to cell group and love God? How can I do all that? Only these things. You got to have a rested soul. Then you find the easy yoke and the light burden. Everybody say with me, say rested soul. Rest soul. Say easy yoke. Easy yoke. Say light burden. Light burden. You, I, I know I got you to turn around a bit, but turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say those three things. Rested soul, easy yoke, light burden. Say it. Yeah. Yeah. But take note, what is the secret ingredient? God, God, God. Yeah, you can, you can be alone in the room. God is not there, he's not going to help. Yeah, you can be very quiet, but you're not engaged with God, it's not going to help. Learning to slow down to engage God. Taking the Sabbath rest to enjoy God. Withdrawing from all the noises and the demands of the world spending some moments of silence and solitude in His presence. 
So this past week, I brought some of our key staff for such a retreat. And everyone, unanimously, every one of them has said, their lives have been transformed. How? Just three days and two nights. I put them each in a room of their own. Even the husbands and wives, they each have their own room. And every day, we only met for three to four hours for the word, for worship, for discussion. Just, that's it, three to four hours in a, in a whole day. During meal times, most of us ate in silence. And then for the rest of the 20 hours, we were alone with God. No mobile phones, no electronic tablets, no laptops, no TV, no music, no Instagram, no Facebook, no TikTok, no YouTube, no Spotify, no internet. Just a Bible, maybe a book. I allow them just to bring a small little book and a journal and a pen. So this is a very different kind of a retreat. No team building games, no fun nights with skits, no deliverance ministry, no barbecue and campfire. Just learning the rhythm and lifestyle of Jesus. Withdrawing to a quiet, lonely place to meet with God. And it was life changing. How come? Why is it so powerful? What happens when you're all by yourself in God's presence? Three things normally happen. Three things. Number one, there is meditation. Meditation. What is meditation? Meditation simply means applying your mind to the Word of God. Applying your mind to the Word of God. Now, let me be very clear. I learned a long time ago from Professor Roger, Christian meditation is not the same as practicing mindfulness, which is very popular these days. In fact, I'm, I met many Christians who say, oh, pastor, I practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware of your present moment, focusing on your breathing, clearing your mind. If anything, Christian medita meditation is quite the opposite. It's very different. It's engaging your mind in the Word of God. Yeah. It's feeling it with God's Word, which is very powerful. Because the word of God is the bread for your soul. Jesus says, you shall live by every word from his mouth. So you are strengthened by it. The word is the lamb unto your feet, the light to your path. It will guide you. It will direct you. The whole universe was created by the word of God. Psalms 138 says that God magnifies his word even above his name. I mean, the name of God is the most powerful thing, but God has chosen to magnify His Word even above it. That's how powerful the Word is. Faith comes by hearing, talk to me, hearing by the Word of God. We are cleansed and sanctified by the washing of the Word. The Word heals us. He sent His Word to heal your disease. The Word delivers us. The Word of God, Jesus says, is spirit and life. Now, you are meditating when you are focusing your mind on the Word of God. Psalms 119 and verse 148, David says, my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your Word. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do it according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Yeah. So meditation is simply any mental activity in the Word. Any activity in the Word. For example, hearing the Word. This morning you're sitting here listening to the preaching. In a sense, you're meditating. Reading the Word, studying the Word, thinking about the Word, reflecting on it, discussing it, talking about it. You're in meditation. Yeah. 
you are applying your mind to know God's truth, to understand what God is saying. Or you may be memorizing verses, yeah? Verses like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. Yeah, he leads me beside the still waters. You may be reciting Bible promises. You're imagining it. You're visualizing it, confessing it. Oh, you're so good in that. Praying out the scriptures, declaring the word of God over your situation. And most of you here in City Harvest Church, you have learned to be very good at all these things. What are you doing? You are meditating. Every time you apply your mind to the Word of God, you are meditating. And this is what you are doing during your quiet time. Or when you come to church to listen to a sermon, or you go to cell group, or you have Bible study, or you attend SOT. Applying your mind to the Word of God, you're meditating. But this is usually where we stop. We stop at meditation. That's it. Turn to your neighbors and say, don't stop at meditation. <sighs> yeah. I want you to take you deeper today. I want to bring you to that rested soul. I want to help you find balance. You need to come to contemplation. What is contemplation? Contemplation is loving God without words. It's coming into His presence with no agenda, no strings attached. So you're not raising your voice in praise. You're not doing intercession. You're not in spiritual warfare coming against the strong man of the territory. You're not asking God, do this, do that for you. Do this, do that for others, for your family. No, you're, you're not coming to God with an agenda. You simply quieten your heart and your soul to receive His love and to rest in His love. Now, when you are meditating, you are in control. But in contemplation, you let go of that control. You just open up your heart as widely as you can to love God and receive that love without saying any word. Coming into His presence with no strings attached, with no agenda. So from the active faith of meditation, you enter into quiet rest. And Isaiah 30 verse 15 says, in quietness and trust is your strength. So you enter into quiet trust. From active faith, you step into quiet trust. When you can be quiet and just trust, something happens to your soul. It gets strengthened. So contemplation is soaking in God's love. You're not in a petition mode. You're not intense in, in intercession. You're not doing your faith confession. You let go of control and let the Holy Spirit take over. You come before God with no agenda, no strings attached, no words. You let go of all your worry and anxiety. You let go of all your frustrations. You just simply rest in God's love and respond to that love. You know, in meditation, I focus on Christ for me. Jesus is for me. His victory on the cross is for me. I sing, I know that you are for me. I know, and God is fighting for me. Christ is for me. That's meditation. In contemplation, I don't focus on that. I focus on Christ in me. And I in Christ. 
And who is Jesus? Jesus is love, 100%. So I become very aware. I'm one with him in love, and he is one with me in love. I'm one with the God who is love. St. John of the Cross said this. Let me read this to you. He was a great man of God who lived a long time ago. He says, the difference between meditation and contemplation of the soul is like the difference between working and enjoying the fruit of our work, between the toil of traveling and the rest of our journey's end. In other words, when you are meditating, you're working. True, right? You're praying, you're confessing. You're using your mind, you're activating it. Some of you intercessors, you pray so much, you lost your voice. Some of you worship leaders, you dance so much, you're so tired. You're working. Because you're actively thinking, visualizing, speaking, discussing, praying, confessing. You can be very intense. When you're doing a quiet time, the music is on. You're hearing the music. You're watching the YouTube video, listening to your favorite preacher, or you're studying the books. You're saying a lot of words in discussion or in prayer. But in contemplation, you are enjoying the fruit of your work. You are enjoying. You have been laboring in the Word of God. Now you're learning to enjoy the God of the Word. I don't want to study, study, study the Word of God so much. I never encounter the God of the Word. You get it? Yeah. In meditation, you're toiling to go somewhere. You're trying to get to know God more. You're trying to bring uh, your needs to Him. You want to reach the place of revival, a breakthrough. You're praying down heaven. You want to change the spiritual atmosphere. In contemplation, you are enjoying the rest of the end of your journey. You're just sitting in God's presence, sitting there, sitting there to enjoy Him, fully open to Him with no strings attached, no agenda. I tell you, I love it as your pastor that I could freely hang out with people whom I love with no agenda, no strings attached. I love it. During my off day, Sun and I, our favorite haunt is Jams, <laughs> Jurong East Mall. And we just go there holding hands, no agenda. We're not there to shop, we're not there to buy things, do grocery, we just go there and walk. Sometimes just watch people, <laughs> see our members, hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. When, when, when the staff, the leaders say, Pastor, can we hang out? And, and we go and hang out and just enjoy each other. They're not asking me about work. They're not seeking counsel. We're just spending time enjoying each other's company. But sometimes they trick me. Pastor, can, Chinese New Year, can we just meet, just hang out? I come to your house and just hang out. We bring some food and we ate for five minutes. They ask me questions for three hours, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, what do you think about this? Pastor, what do you think about that? How do we solve this? Pastor, can you counsel me? My group is not growing. Can you help me? What else should I do? And I felt trapped, <laughs> trick. And then when they left, I'm so tired. Next time they say, Pastor, can we fellowship? <laughs> I meet you in the office. <laughs> because fellowship means we can meet in the office to work. In contemplation, this is what happens. You sit in God's presence. You gaze upon His love, receiving it, soaking in it, just enjoying it, enjoying God. And you give Him all your love and your affection in return. What is happening? You're experiencing Psalms 46 verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. You are experiencing 
Psalm 62 and verse 1. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. This is where your soul is saved. Your soul is in rest. Then, easy yoke, light burden, balance. When you can wait in God's presence, in silence and solitude, something happens to your inside. Like a flower, your soul opens up to God's love. And His love touches you very deeply, sometimes in areas you never knew existed. Your heart begins to melt. Tears begin to flow freely from your eyes. Because when love comes in, there is always healing. Always, always, there is healing. And that's why people, when they meet God, you hear testimonies. Jesus walked into my room. Oh, I had a vision of God. And when people meet God, they always cry. Because healing is happening. And there is refreshing and renewing and deep rest, deep, deep rest. And you know everything is going to be okay. You're no longer just engaged in the Word. You're now fully engaged in God Himself. Very aware of His tangible presence. Very aware of His love for you. All your missional tendencies are set aside. What you can do for Him, what you want Him to do for you and through you. All that set aside. All your worries and anxieties are set aside. All your needs and wants, what you can get from Him, all these things are set aside. Nothing is more important than for you to experience His love for you. And you're giving Him all the space and the time to do what He wants and to say what He wants to you. The more you soak in that love, the more you open up to Him, to listen deeply to His still small voice. And like Elijah, you may hear the voice of God in the sheer silence. And I've learned to realize that is his favorite voice. Or like Jacob, the Lord may ask you, what is your name? Meaning, who are you really? Why don't you reveal your true self to me? Why don't you show me the real you? I know you're strong. I know you're working hard. I know you're trying to make things happen. I know you're frustrated. Why don't you show your real you to me? Why are you hiding? Why are you running away? Why must you be so intense all the time? Why are you so angry? Or why are you so sad or so anxious? Why don't you reveal the real you before me, a real God? Why don't you just open up yourself to me and allow me into your weakness? into your fears, into your sadness? Why don't you just let me into your anger, into your frustration? You know, for you to be able to do that, you must really let go. Eh? For me, this was my turning point when I'm away from you during those years, alone with, with God in His presence. I was brutally honest to Him. And he was extravagantly loving to me. The more brutally honest I was, the more extravagant he was in his love. I vented out all my anger and all my frustration. And he just patiently, kindly listened to me as I vented and vented. I told him all my disappointments and all my anguish. And His love just washed over me again and again. 
until all the anger's gone, until all the anguish we're in dissipated. And then I realized the more I experience God's love, that it's possible to have zero anger. To have zero anger within. It was at this point that Jacob completely changed, forever changed. And it was at this point my life was forever changed and completely changed. Hallelujah. Amen. Without contemplation, there can be no lasting change. And this why many have discovered that silence and solitude is really the furnace of transformation. At times, it can be scary because you're making yourself known to God. You are revealing the real you to Him. This week, we have one staff that have gone through a very painful time and she said she was so scared to be alone with God because she's so scared to let God know that she's angry with Him. So she was busy praying, doing intercessory, doing serving, but she just doesn't want to come before God that way and say, God, I'm really angry and I don't understand. She said that after about more than a day in God's presence, she felt Jesus sat next to her on the bed. And she told the Lord. And she cried and wailed for the next two hours. And God just loved her and healed her. You see, when you feel safe to do that because you're in His presence, alone with God, quiet before Him, fully assured in love and overwhelmed by that love, you will be fully honest with Him. You will feel very safe to be real. This was the experience of many of our staff this past week. And you know, as church workers, we work very hard. We teach, we preach, we counsel, we lead prayer meetings, we fellowship, we talk and talk and talk, we laugh, we talk some more. <laughs> Sometimes we, we go to a meeting, we have to be the life of the party. People are not talking, we've got to stir up the conversation. And it's very easy for our Christian life, even as Christian leaders, to get stuck at a meditation level, even in God's presence. We study the Word, we memorize Scripture, we discuss, we testify, we pray, we confess, we declare, we proclaim. <laughs> we are very busy meditating activating our mind in the Word, trying to be sensitive in the Spirit, but still, we are very much in control. But when we come into contemplation, we surrender that control. We stop planning. We stop talking. We stop singing. We stop interceding. We open our hearts to God's love and let that love overwhelm us. One of the staff said that it took him one and a half days to let, just slow down and come before God with no more agenda. For one and a half days, his mind was thinking, planning. I got to do this. I got to pray for this. I got to do that. The mind cannot stop because it's so used to all this busyness. It took him one and a half. And he's one of our most senior staff. He said, Pastor, when my mind stopped, and I could just love God for who He is. <laughs> he said the love just hit him. He felt so changed. This was the experience of many staff this past week. They all rested quietly in God's love, away from people, away from all the noises and busyness and needs and needs and needs of life and ministry of their kids, their family, and they were all overcome by divine love. Issues that had been repressed and covered up for years came up to the surface. 
all the anxieties, all the weaknesses, all the disappointments, all the anger. And they had very deep conversation with God. And they wept as the Holy Spirit ministered to them and healed them. So meditation stirs up and strengthens your inner man. So we build up strong inner man in our church. I want to lead you into this. Contemplation opens you up to God's love and bring deep, deep healing to your tired, wounded soul. This is what Jesus meant when he says in John 15, verse 9 to 10. He says, make yourself at home in my love. Remain intimately at home in my love. Be at home in the love of God. Only with a soul that's rested in love will you be refreshed and renewed. Will you find the easy yoke and the light burden? Jürgen Mottmann, he's a German scholar, one of the greatest theologians in the past 100 years. I just finally finished his book last month, The Spirit of Life. Took me almost three months to finish that book. <laughs> and Mottmann says that Meditation with contemplation are the means through which the Holy Spirit transforms us into Christ-likeness. You need both, meditation and contemplation, if you want to be more and more like Jesus. How many of you want to be more and more like Jesus? Put up your hands. Yeah. A blending of both. Meditation, applying your mind to the Word of God, which you are already so good. And contemplation, learning to rest and respond to the love of God. Turn to your neighbors and say, you need both. Yeah. This is how we grow in Christ's likeness. This is how our soul finds rest and inner joy. This is how we come into the easy yoke and the light burden. Three things should happen when we spend time with God like this. We have seen two of them, meditation, contemplation. I will leave the third one to the next time. Everybody say meditation. meditation. Everyone say contemplation. contemplation. How many of you want to love God more? Put up your hands. Yeah. Why don't we all stand out on our feet right now? Oh, hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. Jesus loves you so much. And he knows how tired you are. He knows how stressed you are. He knows how frustrated and how much you struggle to make life work. Why don't we just come before Jesus? Let's just worship him, shall we? Let's just all pray in tongues just for a bit. So do the Allah Karabaha, 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 the Allah
I want to read to you from Luke chapter 10, verse 40 to verse 42. It says, But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. You see, church, Martha was losing her balance. She was distracted. She cannot focus anymore. Martha was angry with God. God, don't you care? Don't you care how much I struggle to make ends meet? Don't you care about this miscarriage I had? Don't you care? Where are you, God? With my loved ones struggling with sickness, don't you care? Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset with many things, but few things are needed, and indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. This morning, I want every eye to close and every head to bow, and the, the keyboard could play. And I just, I wonder how many of you, you are losing your balance. You're getting distracted by so many things. You're losing your walk with the Lord. You're losing work-life balance. Some days you feel you're out of control. I wonder how many of you here, you're angry with the Lord. You cannot understand why bad things have happened. And you're struggling. Lord, where are you? You're supposed to be Jehovah Jireh. My provider, I'm struggling to make ends meet. Lord, where are you? Jehovah Rapha, you're supposed to be my healer. What about this cancer? What about this stroke? What about this disability that I, it's not getting any better? Maybe some of you here, you're worried so many things. Like Martha, worried with so many things. Worry about the future, your kids your family, your career, your job. And maybe you're, you're finding yourself irritable, frustrated, upset easily. Jesus is not angry with you, just like He was not angry with Martha. Jesus is not even upset that you're working hard and you're busy. He just doesn't want you to be so frustrated. He wants you to find rest. Come to me, all those that are weary and heavy laden. Let me give you that rested soul so that you are able to have the easy yoke, the light burden. How many of you say, Pastor, that's me. You're talking about me. I'm like Martha. I identify with Martha. And today I want to come to you to find a rested soul. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to lift up your hands. One, two, three. Lift up your hands all over this place. All over this place. All over this place. All over this place. Lift up your hands. God sees all your hands. You can put it down. This is what I want you to do. We're going to sing this song again from the beginning. We're going to worship God. We're going to spend some time quiet before the Lord. But when, I, when, I, when we sing, I'm going to ask all of you, that lift up your hands. I want you to come to the front. We are not going to lay hands on you. So ushers, we don't need to have catchers, ushers. We don't need to stand. I want you to come and stand as close as you can, all the way to the edge of the stage, to the left, to the right, because hundreds of you put up your hands today. We're all going to come before the Lord. And I tell you, something happens. When you take that one step toward the Lord, His love takes 10,000 steps towards you. 
So when I count to three, all those that put up your hands from the front to the back, you just come. Many of you pastors, you just come to the front. Many of you cell group leaders, you just, just, just be real today. Let's just be real. Let's come before God with the real us, before the real God. So come right now, wherever you are, just come. Just come right now. Just come all over this room. Just come. Just come. Presence of God is here. Hallelujah. Let's sing from the beginning, shall we? You dance over me.
Be aware God loves you. He loves you so much. Just receive that love. Just love the Lord. Just receive that love.
king and the king loves me. I love the king and the king loves me. Sit in the presence just for just a little bit more. Just sit in the love of God. the passion of these eyes that I adore. Church, finally, we have found time to pause and gaze our eyes upon Jesus and His beauty. And this is what He says to us. I can't resist the passion of your eyes that I adore overpowered by a glance my ravished heart undone held captive by your love I am truly overcome city harvest for your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice. They just come before Him. That's all He requires of us. Tell Jesus your yearning. Let your heart, your soul be yielded.
Prof, could you just close us in prayer? Would you close your eyes just one more time? The psalmist prayed of God, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. This is the prayer of someone who had such courage. He had committed adultery, had arranged the murder, and yet he could be still and know his God who searched him and knew all of his ways. The tenderness of the Lord. What courage. Whatever your idea of God is, please, please consider the merciful, compassionate love of God who enters into the deepest parts of our being. And as Paul prayed for the believers at Ephesus, may you be strengthened in your inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Kong, um, I'm glad I lived long enough to hear this sermon in church. Thank you. I didn't know I would hear it in a church like this. Thank you. You know, you know, the truth is, so many things I said, Prof, is I learned from you. Um, statements like, you need to reveal the real you before the real God. I learned from you. Prof, thank you so much for journeying with us, journeying with me. Amen. By the way, I, I learned a new language. You learned something? Amen. Thank you so much. Guys, are you glad you came to church today? Amen. Why don't we just give each other a big hug and say Jesus loves you so much. You just do that right now. <laughs>